Andrews University thought we might recognize people not because we remember their faces accurately, but because our mental images of them is actually distorted, like a cartoon. Well, to test that theory, they've developed this. It's a computer that turns people's photos first into cartoons and then into this. Now, somewhere in here, I've got a picture of Kate. There we are. Oh, That's great. Kate. What are you going to do to this, then? Well, when the photo is put into the computer, <laughs> over 100 points are marked on the face at the ends of the eyebrows, tip of the nose, hairline, and so on. And by joining the dots, the computer makes a kind of map and then the computer compares the map of Kate's face with an average that was made by combining several people's faces and then exaggerates any differences between the two. And this is what you get. That's with the, with the map. And, the, and then if we take that out... Ugh, what's it going to do? It doesn't look as... There we are, spitting image of you. <laughs> what a grin! <laughs> well, that's not all the system can do. Watch this. Lights, please, music, and take it away, maestro! Brilliant. <laughs> well, I think it's my turn to have a go now. There's one surprising thing that the researchers found is that if they let people adjust the picture until they think it's like the person really is, then they tend to exaggerate the features by up to 80%. Now, that's what I've done here to Howard. And to me, that looks exactly right. But in fact, I have exaggerated the features by 50%. But the system can range from wildly over the top, have a look at this then. Nice, that's <laughs> nice. Yes. To completely normal. Oh, I think that's worse. Or this is what you'd look like if you had an average shaped face out. What do you think of that then? <laughs> Leave it out. <laughs> But the system is a, more than just a bit of fun. The researchers are considering selling their average faces to the cosmetics industry for research into what makes us attractive, even what makes men look like men and women look like women. And the average face could help forensic investigations too by reconstructing what people looked like or even artificially aging them from a photo. Now, here's Judith. This incense burner is 15th century Persian. It's bars, 16th century Chinese. More 15th century Persian, but this Chinese maping vase is a copy. In fact, it was made in 1980, based on a 15th century original. These are very different. They're Ukrainian, circa 1970. Fragments from a lavatory and domestic floor tiles. The technique which allows art historians to distinguish between the maping copy worth about £2,000 and the real thing worth several million is called thermoluminescence. It measures the amount of radiation an object's received. The older it is, the more naturally occurring radiation it will have been exposed to. Now, however, this same technique is being used for something completely different. It's measuring the radiation that these small pieces of pottery and ceramics received on the morning of April the 26th, 1986. The fragments were collected from the town of Pripyat, three kilometres from Chernobyl, from this block of flats, high-rise 15, from this children's play area, and from this hospital. When Unit 4 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant blew up, it was the people living in Pripyat who received some of the highest doses of radiation. They were evacuated over the next 60 hours and all their property was destroyed to make sure nobody came back for anything. But no one knows exactly what dose the people who lived here received or how it might have varied depending on where they were at the time. The only way of retrospectively measuring how much radiation actually reached Pripyat five years ago is by using thermoluminescence. When pottery or a mineral like this fluorite receives a dose of gamma radiation, it leaves a kind of memory of its passage. It knocks electrons out of position. Now, if you heat the object, as I'm doing here, those electrons are able to drop back into their original positions. And as they do that, they give off light and you can just about see it glowing now. 
the amount of light, a measure of the radiation the object's been exposed to. Now, a great deal means two things. Either the object's old, or that it could have received a large dose of radiation all at once. The testing's done with this equipment. You take a very tiny sample, a few grains are enough, and you heat it to 500 degrees Celsius. The light that's given off when it's heated is captured by a sensitive detector in here. And then it's translated into a graph, or in fact something that's called a glow curve. And the height of the curve is in direct relation to the amount of radiation. This one is from a pot which was on the windowsill in that hospital in Pripyat. But it was on the side of the building facing away from Chernobyl. And in fact, this height here shows that it didn't receive a significant dose. Samples from the objects collected in Pripyat last year are now being tested by a network of seven laboratories all around the world. They'll all be ready to report by the end of the year, but their results are already showing that shelter was vital and that even being on one side of a building rather than another made a difference. Hopefully the Soviet authorities will be able to combine this with information they've recorded about the citizens of Pripyat so that the people nearest the Chernobyl disaster will at last know what kind of radiation levels they were exposed to. Now we're going to go over to Peter, who's outside the building. He's outside Television Centre. Put your foot hard down in a fast car like this and very soon you'd be forced well back into your seat. Slam your feet on the brakes and your body would be forced forward, which is good news really because it means your brakes are working. But how do you know if they're working as efficiently as they should? Well, this box should provide a better brake test. Now, normally it's just laid beside the driver there on the, uh, between the driver and the passenger seat. And inside here is a tiny metal weight which is suspended in a magnetic field. When you brake, it's pushed forwards, just like the driver of the car. The extra magnetic force needed to stop the weight from moving gives a measure of the braking force. Now, unlike most brake detectors, which just measure the peak braking force, this does 20 calculations a second, so it'll give you the average braking force over the total braking time, which is a better indication of the state of the brakes. Okay, now we've got one instrument in each of these two cars, so gentlemen, if you'd like to go back to the start there, we'll put them to the test. Incidentally, this system automatically compensates for hills, so you don't need a flat test track. It'll work just as efficiently on a hill like this. Now, we know that both those cars have got efficient brakes, but one of them is going to be applied less effectively. The point is, which one? OK, three, two, one, go! <laughs> oh, they're really going for it this time. <laughs> Lots of smoke from the burning rubber. Now let's take a look at the reading in this car. It's 0.479. Now the only thing that you have to remember is that the higher the reading, the faster the braking. So if we take a look at the reading in this car, it's gone up to 0.54. So this car has braked more efficiently. The system was originally intended as a test for on-site uh, uh, dumper trucks, in fact and it's now being tried out on trains and planes and even on roller coasters. But now here's Howard with his contribution for the future. I'm taking part in this country's first large-scale genetic screening program. This mouthwash sample will be used to screen my genetic material to see if I carry the gene for cystic fibrosis, Britain's most common inherited lethal disease. The results of this trial will help the National Health Service to decide whether the whole of the UK's population should be screened for cystic fibrosis in the same way. And in the year 2020, they could well be looking into my genetic material for far more than that. We will know in 30 years' time, I imagine, a lot about the genetic background that makes lots of people more likely to get heart disease, cancers, and so forth. And we will be able, perhaps, to screen people for these predispositions. As we get more and more information about our genetic makeup, we have to consider what we will do with it, who will have access to it, 
just your doctor? Or will your employer have the right to know your genetic details? Or your insurer? And who knows, perhaps prospective partners will demand to see a genetic map before they agree to get married. Whatever happens in the future, it'll depend on our attitudes towards genetic screening. And that's what this trial that I'm taking part in aims to tackle. In Britain, five children every week are born with cystic fibrosis. Throughout their lives, they must have regular, strenuous physiotherapy to shift the sticky fluid that forms in their lungs. Few who have the disease survive beyond their late twenties. Children with cystic fibrosis have inherited two copies of a particular defective gene, one from each of their parents. Although each parent carries a single copy of the genes themselves, they are perfectly healthy. Here, doctors are testing adult volunteers to see whether or not they carry that gene. The first question for the doctors running this trial was who should be screened? Should they only consider pregnant women and their partners, or should the test be available to anyone who might one day have children? If we were screening cattle, the most efficient way of doing it would be to screen when they were pregnant. However, people aren't cattle, and people when they are pregnant are at their most vulnerable, Certain of the choices they might want to make, such as not getting pregnant, can't be made anymore. They're already under some emotional pressure, and that seems to us a bad time to screen. So, we believe that it would be better to be able to offer people screening before they get pregnant. In Britain, one person in 20, that's about 2 million people, are carriers of cystic fibrosis. Now, if I'm one of them, do I really want to be told, or would I rather just take my chance? Just facing the possibility that you might be carrying a defective gene is really quite disturbing. Counselling to cope with worries like this is a crucial part of the programme. Here, leaflets explain the basics, and then the project nurse goes over the details again. Have you got your sample? Thank you. This will go off for analysis, and it takes about three weeks for the result to come back. If you are found to be a carrier, I'll ask you to come back again and see me for further counselling and also invite any other members of your family who might want to be tested. Right now, I don't know if my worries will be short-lived or if the implications of this test will spread right through my family. And the advice offered can't always be straightforward because the test itself isn't perfect. One of the worst situations is where a couple are tested and one is a carrier and one is not a carrier. The problem is that you're not absolutely sure that the one who's not a carrier really isn't a carrier, so there still is a small chance that they could have an affected child. How do you explain that to them? You could say, because of our test results and because one of you is a carrier and we're not absolutely sure that the other isn't, there is a one in 600 chance that you will have an affected child. That's three or four times more than the average risk to the average couple in the population. Or you could just say to them, well, the chances that you'll have an affected child, it's 600 to one in your favor, and that's really a very small risk. The way in which you put the numbers will alter people's views on whether they are really at serious risk or not. And it's very important that they should understand the facts and not get them tangled up. Whilst I wait for my results in another week or so, I can chew over all the possibilities. In 30 years' time, we could all be facing situations like this on quite a regular basis. I think we already know that some people are genetically more likely to get breast cancer than other people. Some people are more likely to get heart disease or schizophrenia than other people. As we learn about these genetic predispositions, we will also probably develop screening tests. They'll pick out people at high risk. Sometimes those people won't be able to do anything about it. Sometimes, by altering their lifestyle, they may be able to lessen the risk. I think we have to start worrying now about how society is going to handle tests of that sort, whether we want them, how we want to provide them, and a whole host of social and ethical and legal and insurance problems that will come in the wake of screening tests of that sort. It'll be two years at least before the trial going on here can offer any information about our general attitudes towards genetic testing. But in 2020, who knows?
If genetic testing does become a regular part of our lives, it'll only be because we all got down to thinking about what it means now, whilst we still have plenty of time. A group of European scientists are this week trying to rekindle efforts to limit acid rain. They're hoping to convince politicians that all existing plans are inadequate because they don't account for pollution coming from Eastern Europe. The group spent six years studying how the gases which cause acid rain drift across national borders. Looking at Europe as a whole, they say the best way to make big cuts in acid rain would be for Western Europe to pay for Eastern Europe to clean up its act. Dead trees are only one result of acid rain, but the gases which cause it can also lead to serious health problems. Power stations and factories in East European countries have little pollution control, and their new governments can't afford to fit more. The scientists argue that it's in the West's interest to foot the bill, because so much of the pollution ends up in Western Europe anyway. But they also point out that equipment alone is not enough. To cut acid pollution to an acceptable level, fundamental changes in factory design and a much greater emphasis on energy conservation will be needed. New research from the Transport and Road Research Laboratory shows that airbags fitted to motorbikes could significantly reduce fatal head injuries. Direct collisions, typically when a motorbike hits a car pulling out from a side road, cause most head injuries. The researchers measured how the blow to a dummy's head in a collision at 30 miles an hour on a range of bikes. With an airbag specially fitted, the head didn't hit the car nearly as hard. Even in the worst cases, the force of the impact was reduced to a quarter of what it was without the bag. In practice, the report points out that although airbags could make bikes safer, there are simpler things that could be done to prevent accidents happening in the first place. They say that 70% of Britain's motorcycles are fitted with an inadequate headlamp. And finally this week, a warning. Porcupines may be on the prowl on Dartmoor again, ten years after they were supposed to have disappeared. In 1969, a pair of Himalayan porcupines escaped from a private collection. Within two years, they'd bred, and animals were spotted up to ten miles away. Porcupines generally live off roots and tree bark, but as the Himalayan variety grow nearly a metre long, a few can make their presence felt. After a spruce plantation was damaged, a dog and cat were speared by quills, and the porcupines started taking over the local badger's burrows, the Ministry of Agriculture stepped in. By 1979, they'd recaptured six animals, and they thought they'd got them all. But now there's been another sighting. They're strictly nocturnal animals, so the locals have been sent a leaflet, showing them what to look for. Trees with telltale teeth marks, droppings, and, unmistakable this, foot-long quills. Now, here's Judith with a report on how a principle used in air traffic control is helping a new medical venture to get off the ground. Five years ago in Dorchester, a chance lunchtime discussion between a consultant radiologist and a physicist led to an idea that could now make a standard medical procedure far more effective. Well, since it's very, very tiny, I'm not sure when the numbers will add up. They'd been chatting about a common problem with using ultrasound scanners. Ultrasound pictures of the inside of the body have been routinely used for about 15 years to monitor pregnancies. Cell samples can also be taken for diagnosis by inserting a needle and using the screen to guide it. Or for patients like Ron Moscrop to drain an internal abscess, simply done with a local anaesthetic. You hold your breath now. Ultrasound imaging is completely safe, but its success depends on the skill of the radiologist in guiding the needle into exactly the right spot. At some angles, the needles are difficult to see. The shaft shows up clearly enough against darker areas of fluid, but then gets lost in the lighter areas of tissue. And to make it even harder, the end of the fine needle can bend against hard tissue, giving a false impression of where the actual tip is. 
So if they were taking cell samples to check for a tumour, for example, they might get a sample from normal tissue and miss the tumour. So what they've invented here is an electronic guidance system so you know where the tip of the needle is at all times. Transpond it on. On the very tip of the needle, they've attached a minute sensor called a transponder. The ultrasound beam scans the body, and every time the beam passes the needle tip, the transponder generates a tiny electrical charge. Much clearer, isn't it? Yeah. That signal is sent back down a wire inside the needle shaft to an amplifier so that it appears as a much brighter spot on the scanner. In fact, it's rather like the radar used by air traffic control to identify individual aircraft. And that's not surprising, really, because the inventor started off in the aircraft industry. I worked in the, in the military aircraft industry, um, designing electronics. It was great fun, and at the time there were great resources. Um, but I wanted to produce something which was uh, of more positive benefit, if you like, to mankind. And uh, that's why I made the switch to medical, medical physics. His idea was clearly useful, but medical technology has its own special problems. Well, a device like this is used inside the body, and the very stringent requirements and safety and production of the, the actual instrument. He made the first needles by hand, but to meet safety standards and be commercially viable, they would have to be disposable and cheap. Finding a way to reliably mass-produce such a tiny electronic instrument proved a major technical problem. The most difficult part was the transponder on the needle tip. It's made from a special metal-coated plastic which produces an electrical charge when exposed to ultrasound. But making it into sensors the size of a microdot that will still generate a detectable signal has taken years to refine. How they've achieved that is a trade secret. And they'd hoped to keep it in Britain. The problem we kept finding was the ultrasound companies would say they didn't know about needles, and the needle companies say they didn't know anything about ultrasound and electronics. And what we had here was a device which, although it was a needle, it was actually a, a, a step, a significant step in technology, because it was a, a needle with a sensor on it. And therefore, companies who might have taken it up had to go away and somehow decide whether there's a big enough market for this new type of device. Meanwhile, their mounting publications drew interest from one of the largest American ultrasound companies. So, not for the first time, a British invention went abroad. It partly reflects the fact that we don't have, I don't think, a, an organisation in this country with the resources now, and in the particular area of technology here, um, to have taken this on and made a big success in the way that the American company is likely to. And that's a reflection of the manufacturing base in the, in the UK and the way it's declined. The system has already been launched successfully in America. Now, at last, the first commercial version to arrive in this country is being tried out in the Dorset County Hospital, where it all began. Hmm. Now, remember that hot seat at the top of the show? Well, it marks the start of a fantastic new Tomorrow's World competition with prizes that will reveal the fascinating science of space and give you a stunning holiday at the same time. Tonight and over the next three weeks, we'll be asking you a series of questions, get them all right, and you could be heading for Canada, the Canary Islands, Florida, or Hawaii. Hawaii is America's 50th state. Beautiful weather, the tumbling surf of the Pacific Ocean, fabulous beaches. But if you need something more than sun, sea, and sand, there's science. And it will be the experience of a lifetime, because on the 11th of July, the moon will pass exactly between the Earth and the sun, producing a total solar eclipse, the longest the Earth will see in the next 40 years. And Hawaii is one of the best vantage points in the world. Well, this week's question is, what force is holding Kate up? Well, I can spin around freely, so there are no strings attached, but there is a power cable up there connected to the top. Well, the force forms a field around the Earth, but not the moon. What is the force? Well, if you need any more help, the Radio Times, published next Tuesday, gives you another question with the same answer. It's this one here. The competition details and the answer grid are also inside that copy of the Radio Times, and the winners will be drawn live on Tomorrow's World on the 6th of June, winning one of those four fantastic holidays. And like Hawaii, they'll all have an extra space science ingredient. So remember, it's what force is holding me up. Now for something completely different. 
Robot Sumo Wrestling. These robots were the first competitors to take to the floor of the All Japan Robot Sumo Contest. The usual sumo rules apply. The robots must try to push each other out of the doyo, or ring. But for Delilah and Mighty Mallet here, when it comes to technology, they're somewhat underwhelming. What you might call all hardware and no software. These are both remotely controlled by humans. But the Japanese also hold another sumo contest where the robots must be completely independent of their owners once they're in the ring. They're much smaller. In fact, they must weigh no more than three kilograms and fit inside this 20 centimeter square box. Once they're correctly lined up, the inventors must take a good step back and leave the robots to fight for themselves. Here's Tintray Charlie versus the Black Devil. <laughs> 